everybody, welcome to the Comic Gamer Movie Show. My name is Deshaun, and today I am here to review A Quiet Place Day One. Now, A Quiet Place Day One is the prequel to the 2018 Quiet Place and its sequel that came out, I believe, in like 2022, something like that. Like, it came out not that long afterwards, but it's the sequel to A Quiet Place One and Two, The Quiet Place Day One. Now, the A Quiet Place is, particularly that first movie, to me, holds a special place in my heart. Now, first of all, it was the directorial debut of John Krasinski. I think he's directed some things since then. Um, I think if, I think John Krasinski directed that um, animated slash live action movie, If. But this was by far, you know, so far his best thing he did was A Quiet Place. It To this day, it's one of the most unique um, theater experiences I've ever had. And I, I've had a couple of them fun theater experiences that I've debated like making a list of my the most unique theater experiences that I've had because I've gone to the movie theaters a lot but the but I will never forget watching that movie because it's another one of those movies that no one knew what to expect from it the original quiet place no one knew how good it was gonna be we heard things but like no one really knew until you get into that theater and I've never felt an audience so scared because the entire, because the unique thing, you know, the situation of the movie, these aliens, these um, death angels, as they call them, or as John Krasinski, I don't know if they ever called them that in the movie or if John Krasinski called them that, but somewhere along the way they got the name death angels. These alien, you know, skinny, tall, just like rabid animals looking things. Well, no, actually, yeah, these skinny, tall, rabid animals just walking on their walking on their knuckles. These aliens, they get only—they're very hypersensitive to sound. So it became a world where everything's quiet because noise means death, and when noise means death, then that means everything's quiet. So so much of the movie is quiet. In fact, the, there's there are there's minimal dialogue in the in the entirety of that first Quiet Place movie. If I'm recalling correctly. You really only get dialogue when him when um John Krasinski is talking to his son on the waterfall. Outside of that, there really isn't any dialogue. It's like there's like what three or four lines in the entire movie. That movie's almost two hours, but it all works because of the way that the situation is set up and the way that the world is set up. And you get this very tense, very where everything's noise is scary even when it's nothing it's creepy it's scary i mean that scene when emily blunt stepped on a nail was hard like i mean i love that original quiet place and it was one of the most unique um theater theatrical experiences i've ever had quiet place 2 was a good follow-up i thought it was a good movie i thought it was a good follow-up not quite to the caliber of the fuck quiet place one but you know we but the mist but we know a little bit more the mysteries like the we're kind of um used to what they're going for it's like John Wick 2 to like John Wick 1, in my opinion, Quiet Place 2 to, to um, Quiet Place 1, where it's like, they don't actually do anything too much better than the original, but it's just more, more of the same. So we get to A Quiet Place Day 1, starring Napita Nyong'o and Joseph Quinn. Now, Napita Nyong'o is really good, has been in these horror things, other than like, um, what was it, um, Nope, no, not Nope, um, Us. She was in Us, she was amazing in Us. And she's obviously um, Nakia in um, Black Panther franchise, and she's been in a bunch of other things. And Peter Nyong'o is an Oscar-winning actress. She she's a star, you know. That's why I, I I rooted for years for her to take um the mantle of Black Panther because I was like, you got you got an Oscar-winning actress right here at the, at your um disposal at uh, you, at your fingertips. You might as well use her. So she's the lead in this. Joseph Quinn is also her co-star. But I'd say she's mainly the star because you learn more. You learn the most about her. It start you follow her the entirety of the time. Joseph Quinn's character doesn't even show up to about 20 minutes into the movie, 20, 30 minutes, almost 30 minutes into the movie. So I would say she is the main, main character. Now, she plays a character who is in a unique spot in her life. Cause So this is day one, by the way. So when they say day one, they mean this is before everything fucking happened. This is before the scene. Because I know you guys probably saw the sequence in um, A Quiet Place Part 2, which is one of the things that was cool. You got In A Quiet Place Part 2, you got to see a tiny bit, a tiny bit of 
how things were before these aliens landed. You did. You got to see the beginnings of it. But it was only like like maybe what tw like um, ten minutes of it. You got to see ten minutes of it here. This you get to say what happened when it, when these aliens landed in New York City, the loudest city city in America. Well, one of the loudest cities on Earth, actually, as it said, as they you know say at the beginning of the movie, New York City is one of the loudest cities on Earth. So what happens when ant when creatures who are who are almost indestructible, near like nearly indestructible, the only weaknesses they have are, as it turns out, as we find out. Since they're hypersensitive to sound, certain frequencies can actually fuck them, can kill them, is certain frequencies in water. They can't swim. They'll drown. So that's it. That is it. That is their only weaknesses. So what happens when these creatures land in New York? Chaos. It looked like 9-11 went off. Like, that's what it looked like. The smoke and the people walking and the... And uh, um, the Peter Nyong'o's character Sam with their face covered in soot and like all that stuff was nuts. The imagery of New York being destroyed by these creatures, the people being just massacred on droves. It was a, it was a. I'm not gonna say it was awesome, but you know, it was a very you. It was fun. It was interesting. It was a different change of pace because the hunger, um, <laughs> hunger. The Quiet Place movies take place. I don't know where, but it's more in a rural area. Like, even in the, when they went to that flashback, it looked like they were in, like, a small little town. You know what I mean? They're, like, kind of out in the boons. This is New York City. This is the city. So it's a very unique, you know, it's very unique imagery. It's kind of like, uh, I had to make this reference, but it's kind of like when the uh, Resident Evil stuff happens in Raccoon City and you see it happen in the desert or Africa or something. It's like, this is a unique, this is a very different view of this, um... Of something we already know, so that's how they kind of give it a um, uh, unique look to it. Because, like I said, um, Quiet Place One and Two kind of take place in very, um, very I'm not gonna say barren areas, but like, like I say, the first movie takes place in a small town. Even the sequel, she gets on a boat to go to a small little, you know, I don't, I don't think it's an island, but it's it's a tiny little thing. You know what I mean? This is New York City, so seeing that imagery with these creatures and the different situations that they, um, Joseph Quinn's character and um, the Peter Niagas characters find themselves in, um, is very unique. Also, there's a cat in this movie, and I thought the cat would annoy me more than I, because usually when people have animals in movies, what the animals always end up fucking the people. You, you know what I mean? The animals always end up putting the people in a situation where it's like, dude, they wouldn't even be in this situation if they did not have this fucking animal. The cat in this movie really was used to put the characters in tense situations, but it never fucked any character. To be fair, the cat never fucked any character. And that was what I was worried about. I was like, if someone dies because of this cat, then this cat's annoying to me. No one died because of the cat, which means, okay, the cat is just here to put the characters in very unique, tense situations that they probably wouldn't be in if the cat wasn't there. But, fine, go ahead. But at the core of this movie, now, while I've seen a lot of people complain about this movie is that you don't get too much more information on the Death Angels, one thing for sure that you do get is that the Death Angels aren't eating people. Like, now, I think you kind of got that information in the first, in the second movie, but they're not eating people. And we really don't know, like, so they're not here, they're not killing people for the, what's the word I'm looking for? For, for substance, because it seems seemingly they brought their own food, as shown that you know they were digging in a crater and they like you see a creature digging in a crater and pick out this goopy looking shit, this like almost alien looking egg looking thing, and they tear it up and they start eating it. AKA they're not eating people, so they brought their own substance. So it's very fascinating what the fuck's going on here. No, there's still the mystery of where they came from, how they got here. Um, I still claim, personally, what I think, because it's just very suspicious. Like, what is the chances of these creatures, of, of these creatures landing on Earth, all over Earth, these creatures, these nearly indestructible creatures. I mean, these things are, these things' shells are so fucking tough, they were able to survive not only traveling through space, but entering the Earth's atmosphere. That's how tough these fucking things are. What are the chances of some creatures like that being sent here? And the only weaknesses they have are certain frequencies in water. And they just so happen to land on all the land masses. I think, like, I don't know if John Krasinski will do this. 
or they'll just always leave it a mystery. But I think that this was like some type of first alien probe attack. Like, if you were gonna take over a planet and plunder all its resources, and you didn't really feel like going to fucking war with this primitive race, wouldn't you drop a wouldn't you drop some attack dogs down there that kill everything that makes a sound? Because literally, theoretically, they would kill all the life life on Earth, but they would leave all the plants, they'd leave all the resources, they'd leave everything else, so you could just come down there. You know, set off something, kill all of them, because they obviously can't fuck with certain frequencies. And then you just plunder the planet. I think this is, that's what it is. Maybe it's not. I'm sure John Krasinski will explain one day where the fuck these creatures came from. But either way, we don't get too much more new information on these creatures other than they brought their own food. Which may be a bit more information and let us know that this shit couldn't have been by accident if they brought their own food. Anywho. But the main story of this movie is the story between um, Sam, played by Nipiti Nyong'o, and the man she meets. I always forget Joseph Quinn's character's name in this. Um, yeah, whatever. It ain't that much. It's not that big of importance. But because th this movie does the thing that, that modern day horror movies, a lot of modern day horror movies do, where the story, where the actual horror aspect, the sci-fi, or not even more modern day horror movies, I mean modern day fiction, modern day sci-fi and fantasy does, which is the sci-fi and the fantasy of it all, the horror of it all, whatever, is the, um, is the hook. But the actual story is something that could work even without any of the context. Even without the alien invasion and all this shit going on, it'd still be a story about a woman, play, um, Sam, who is dying from um, cancer. And she's been dying from this cancer for a very, very long time. And it's been weighing on her and it's weighed her down and it's kind of like depressed her. It's gotten her in a very morose state of mind, meaning this other guy, this other kid, you know, this boy or guy who is also going through some stuff. He's also, you know, not unsure of himself. He's also scared and scared of letting his parents down and scared of different things. And these two people meeting each other and helping each other. She helped him to find his bravery and he helped her live again. You know, because when you're dying, there's nothing, when you're dying, nothing like death really sobers you up. Even me, I tell you, when my grandmother passed away, it really did make me reflect. And death has a tendency to do that to people. So I can only imagine, nobody really knows how they're going to react if they go to a doctor and they tell you you're dying and, you know, you're bad, you're bad enough that you will be dead in a certain time period. Nobody really knows how to react to something like that. And she melted down, but through the through this movie and through the interactions with this um, guy she met in this terrible situation, she was able to remember what it was like to live again. And that part of the movie was very beautiful, was very powerful, and and that is the core of the movie. And it would have worked regardless of the things outside of it, which makes this even more of a great movie. Off of that alone, there's, I would give A Quiet Place Day 1 a 9 out of 10. I loved it. I had a fun time with it. That story, that core story was just so, it was just so heartbreaking. Well, not heartbreaking, it was heartwarming and whatnot. Because, like, you know, you got, there's different ways people face death, man. And she faced it, and she faced it, um, she faced it like a G. Anyways, thank you guys for joining the Concrete Move Show. Please remember to like and subscribe, and I'll see you guys on the next one. Goodbye.